it strikes me that not that much time has passed since I was first told about 80 odd years ago that I played very well for my age. <laughs> Until last week when I was told the same thing. <laughs> I would like to address my few words to the young musicians who are graduating. We are a society that uh, celebrates stars. And one of the ways we do that is by uh, what you might call marketing by using middlemen to help create and support our stars. And I just want to say that the only truly indispensable middlemen in our lives are you and you behind me and me. Because until that moment when an audience can enter a hall and instead of being given a program, they would be given a copy of the music and they would carry that music to their seat and they would open that score and read it with the same pleasure as though they would play it. Until that moment arrives, you and you and I are truly indispensable middlemen. Otherwise, they're just dots of ink on a piece of paper. The, hmm, interesting. <laughs> Give me a moment. Uh, the point that I want to make is that in spite of that being indispensable, you and you and I are not the stars of the event. That's a different perspective for you. The star is the music. You and you and I are the vessel, are the channel through which this music is transmitted from the genius of the composer to you, the listener. So that should give you a certain perspective that is both stress relieving and on a different level, stress raising. <laughs> because great music, and that's what I'm talking about in Schnabel's terms, great music is that music which is better than can be played. So great music is always ahead of you, like the carrot in front of the donkey. You always have better and more beautiful.
to go. The other point that I want to make, and this is mostly for myself, as well as for my distinguished and beloved colleagues and you all who are about to embark on lives in music, try not to, in your teaching, pass on prejudices that you have learned in music. I think the basic function of a teacher, the most important function of a teacher, is to teach how to learn. What aspects of your art you must consider, take under advice, in making your choices and decisions. It's a wonderful life because you can do it at 11.15 a.m. one way and at 11.20 a.m. you can do it another way. And there's no penalty involved. I'd like to end with a story that should also give courage to all of you. Once when I was a kid of, in my early 30s, I had the, the pleasure and honor of playing a chamber music concert in my hometown of San Francisco, the War Memorial Opera House. Uh, and my partners, in that chamber music concert, which included the Brahms C minor quartet and the Schubert E flat, the second piano trio, were some string players by the name of Heifetz, Piatigorsky, and Primrose. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty scary. <laughs> Especially Heifetz, <laughs> with his pale blue eyes his non-smiling, pale blue eyes. <laughs> he was known as a very good ping pong player. So was I. <laughs> and I soon discovered his secret. He didn't play so well, he just didn't sweat. And that intimidated everybody. However, we were backstage in the Blue Room before the concert, and it was one of those Blue Rooms that didn't have a piano. And, you know, in one corner of the room was Heifetz, and the other Primrose, and Piatigorsky, and I just sat there. They were all noodling, warming up. And finally, after about five minutes, I couldn't contain myself any longer. I started to whine. And Piatigorsky, dear, dear, dear man, whose daughter is a friend to many of us here in this room, Jephthah Drachman, uh, he put his cello down on the floor and he came over and he threw his arms around my shoulder. Uh, an enormous man with a deep, Russian voice. And he said, Leonchik, you know, warming up before a concert is like doing breathing exercises before dying. <laughs> Good luck to you all.